Welcome to the Duke Energy Center, to a LEED Platinum certified project. We're very excited to share with you all of the environmental benefits and attributes of this project that make it the highest rated LEED certified project on the planet. My name is Jeff Austin with Wells Fargo's Corporate Properties Group. I lead the sustainability team. The catalyst for this project was really the work that we have done at Wells Fargo and Wachovia to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. One of the critical components to reduce greenhouse gas emissions is the way you would design, build, and operate buildings. In this building, we pursued LEED, which is a mechanism for reducing material use and energy use in the building. We're going to spend a little bit of time today talking about LEED, which is Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. It's the process by which the U.S. Green Building Council um, certifies buildings. In a LEED building, you start with an integrated design process. You bring all the stakeholders together in one place, anyone that will touch that building over the life of this building. That's where you find really integrated strategies. As the sustainable design consultant on the project, my, my role, my responsibility is to work with the architects, the mechanical engineers, the landscape architects, the operators of the building, to integrate the design in such a way that allows the building to perform well environmentally and economically. So, you know, from, from the beginning, you work with the architecture team, TVS Design, to orient the building appropriately, to ensure that we're not just meeting the code requirements for the, the building envelope, but we're exceeding what those are. And you, you integrate their efforts with the mechanical design efforts so that you don't just, um, the approach is not just to use efficient equipment, but to reduce the amount of energy that the building has to use in the first place. That's not um, separate from what the landscape architect does when he's choosing the planting materials that go on the green roof because we're trying to reduce the amount of water they require because we're trying to provide all of that water from, from the site itself. We're collecting all the water that falls on the site so that we can use it to make up water in the cooling tower so we can use it to irrigate the landscape. And if we plant sod on the green roof, then we're going to have way more demand for water than we can meet with the sources that, that fall onto the site. So all of these pieces and parts have to be fit together. And um, so, you know, my role is to facilitate the, the conversation among these different parties, the um, interaction of these folks to ask each other the right questions, to think critically about the impacts and the implications of making a decision in a vacuum. We're down in the uh, eighth level of the service uh, entrance for the Duke Energy Center, uh, about 80 feet in the ground. The yellow columns that you see around us are really the feet of the tower, and um, part of the sustainability uh, features of the building were really to try to leverage uh, this service entrance for multiple users. So we, we have access to uh, the Gantt Center's loading dock from here, the Mint Museum's loading dock, obviously the tower and also um, the future condominium loading dock. And there was lots of concern 
when we started this design about uh, the Mint Museum's uh, traveling exhibits being able to to navigate around this service entrance. So um, early in 2006, while we were excavating the hole, we literally uh, staked out this entire loading dock area um, out off of Tybola Road in the old Charlotte Coliseum and drove tractor trailers around just to make sure that, that it actually worked. Also down here, all of the construction waste gets recycled. So it, it comes in, into bins here and goes out this ramp that behind me um, to date on the project, we've recycled about 93% of all the construction waste on the project, um, and that equates to about 16,000 tons of construction waste that's been diverted from landfills. This building is about 85% um, more efficient than a building of a similar size and scale that was built in a traditional way, and what that equates to is about 30 million gallons of water a year in savings. A big part of that is groundwater. And anywhere in Charlotte that you ex excavate, you're going to run into um, groundwater. It's going to be contaminated. And normally that's treated and discharged into the storm sewer. Um, here, we're treating it and we're actually using it in the mechanical systems. We also are recovering all of the storm water on site and that's used for irrigating uh, all the landscaping on site and also um, at our urban park across the street. In a building like this, the air conditioning runs most of the year, if not all of the year. So there's, it's constantly pulling humidity out of the air, which creates condensate, which is a fairly pure and clean source of water that we're also collecting. There's groundwater under the building that because of, you know, historical uses of the site, you know, in, in the past, um, is contaminated. So we're pumping that water from under the building, decontaminating it, storing that water as well and we're using it to not just irrigate the landscape here at the base of the Duke Energy Center but also at the green roof of the Duke Energy Center and across the street at the green. So um, you know inside the building we've saved 46 percent of the water that a conventional building would use and outside of the building we're, we're capturing 100 percent of the storm water and we're reusing 100 percent of the water that we collect in the cooling towers as well as to irrigate you know, our site and the site next door. So um, in terms of responsibility and environmental stewardship, that's probably the biggest statement we could make. And, and the greatest benefit to the city because, you know, a million, 1.6 million gallons of stormwater means that it's not being released to the city's infrastructure, which, you know, in the long run is, is a you know, benefit to the city because it preserves the longevity of the infrastructure that's there and doesn't require that infrastructure to continue to be expanded. And so it's a big um, benefit to the city and to the people of the city. The daylight harvesting blinds are a significant contributor to the energy efficiency of the building. And the way that this system works, um, basically there's a computer program that um, enables us to know that we're in Charlotte, North Carolina and it's March 1st and understands where the sun rises and sets Eastern Standard Time. These blinds have basically five different uh, degrees of rotation and the computer, knowing where the sun is, directs the maximum amount of sunlight kind of into the space and if this um, floor was finished it would have a finished ceiling with light fixtures that all had dimmable ballasts and those fixtures would basically dim the more um, light that got into the space. Uh, the resulting effect of that across the entire building is basically about five million kilowatts um, hours of, of energy saved every year. This building that you see behind me, this project has been the project of a lifetime not just for me, not just for a small team, but for a whole community. There have been so many people who came together with such an incredible attitude to make this project happen. Um, and that's what I want to tell you about, a little bit about. Um, it all started with a simple little article in the newspaper that said we were going to close a building downtown Charlotte and, and look at whether we were going to renovate it or look at whether we were going to tear it down and do something different. And from that, um, a couple people came to the company and said, well, why don't you do this or why don't you do that? 
And um, our CEO, Ken Thompson, um, told all those people, huh, interesting idea. Go talk to Bob Burgess. And, and from talking to those folks um, and from the confluence of a, a bunch of different things that came together at just the right time, um, this project was born. And, and it really started out with the idea that, gosh, um, the city of Charlotte for so long has wanted to create um, different cultural facilities. And they had a list of those cultural facilities and folks in the community and government and all different types of people had tried to discover ways to fund the construction of those, those facilities. But for one reason or another, it never happened and never happened and never happened. And then we came up with this idea and the idea was, gosh, we have a, a, a new building that we're contemplating. Um, what if we took some of the taxes, the property taxes that would be created by that building and use them to fund the construction of one of these cultural facilities? And that was the simple idea that this all sort of grew from. And at the same time, um, we, Wachovia, were in a position where we were growing tremendously, um, not only in Charlotte, but around the country and internationally. And one of the areas that was fueling that growth the most was our capital markets business. So we did a study to determine whether we wanted to have the majority of that growth in, in what market. And um, as it turns out, we built a new trading floor in Hong Kong. We built a new trading floor in London. We built a new trading floor in New York City. But we decided that the majority of that growth would come here in Charlotte for a bunch of reasons. Well, once we came up with that idea, then we said, boy, if we're going to build a building that houses that type of business, that type of industry, how do we leverage that? How do we, how do we take advantage of the opportunity? And when you're building a business like that and it's growing in Charlotte, North Carolina, you want to be able to attract and retain the best employees you can possibly have, not only for the businesses that were already here, but for the growth that was going to come. And what attracts and what retains great employees? What, what makes someone come to Charlotte when they could go to London, when they could go to Hong Kong, when they could go to New York City? Well, part of that is the, the cultural aspects of a city. And that was something that the city had identified and, and I looked at as an opportunity to say, boy, if we're gonna build this building and we build it to the right size that it looks like we're gonna build it to, we're gonna have enough property taxes generated to pay for not just one cultural facility, but for four cultural facilities. And so I began the journey and I, I went and talked to each different cultural group and as I went and talked to them about possibly being a part of this project, they all sort of looked at me like, you know, is this for real? What's the real possibilities of this? And the more they, they listened and the more they understood how they could be a part of something that was bigger than just Wachovia and bigger than just their cultural group, the more excited they got. And, and there were so many different forces that came into being to make this happen. So for instance, the Arts and Science Council had for years identified these cultural facilities that could be a part of it. And, and the Arts and Science Council said, boy, you know, if we raised an endowment that everyone contributed to, the community contributed to, then that would create the funding for the operations of these new facilities. So they agreed that if we built these four facilities, they would raise the endowment campaign. Um, we went to the city and talked to the city and the city council and the county commissioners and the mayor and, and we asked them for permission to even just talk about this concept of using these property taxes. And it was a really big debate and, and, and a well-placed debate because we have so many needs for public safety, for education, for roads. And here I was proposing that we'd use part of these property taxes for cultural facilities. But the beauty of the idea was that it could be leveraged in so many different ways. Um, from my point of view, for our company, we always look at four different things that we're trying to base our decisions on. What's the best thing for our customers? What's the best thing for our shareholders? What's the best thing for our employees? And then what's the best thing for a community? And, and how many companies have the grace and the ability to look at that community part and do something with it? 
I'm not every company. Um, and it takes a certain amount of courage to step up to that and take, take on that. But that was something that was the Wachovia way. That was the way we looked at the world. When we talked to the city and the county, um, their first thoughts were, well, why would we use our property taxes for this? And, you know, so it helps Wachovia attract and retain employees. And, of course, the answer was no. It not only helps us attract and retain employees, it helps everyone in this community attract and retain employees. And it's not just about employees, it's about education. Um, thousands of school kids a month go through cultural facilities. And, and the ability to learn from art, the ability to learn from culture, is something that is truly valued by those students and I think really recognized by ultimately the, the people who made the decision. Um, also, for, for this community, um, this, this campus concept where we put four cultural facilities together was very unique. Um, the, the idea for the campus was really based on the concept of diversity. Somebody might be sitting in a modern art museum and never think to go to an African American cultural center but it's right across the street and they see the excitement of what's going on in there. So they walk over and maybe they get touched. Who knows how they get touched? But all of a sudden they have an interest that they never would have had before. One of the really interesting parts of this project has been you have all these different stakeholders. You have these different cultural facilities. You have the city who very much cares about the flavor of the city and that it carries throughout the whole area. You have Wachovia who wants to make sure that they're building a very efficient building and a smart building, but one that can serve our, our customers, serve our employees, um, serve the community. Um, how do you deal with all those competing interests? Think of the cultural facilities. Some of these folks have been trying for 10 years to build a new museum downtown. So as they all came together, um, it was so fascinating to, to see how they'd sort of positioned themselves at first and then how they got the theme and, and the, the environment that we were trying to create. Because what we were trying to do was to create something where everyone was a part of the whole. So a good example of that is um, Tryon Street is everything in Charlotte, North Carolina. Everyone wants to be on Tryon Street. This project is centered at first in Tryon Street. So every single entity wanted to be located on the corner of First and Tryon Street. And I wanted to even put my building at the corner of First and Tryon Street. So what do you do? Well, the thing we did was we didn't put anything at First and Tryon Street. And the beauty of that was that if you're standing on First and Tryon Street, you can see every one of these facilities. You can feel every one of these facilities. Uh, another big factor for a lot of the cultural groups is, as well as ourselves was um, we're trying to create structures that are pedestrian friendly. We're trying to create an environment in Charlotte that, that feels comfortable to somebody on the street. And so each one of these cultural groups, when they came to be a part of this campus, were saying, uh, I don't want Wachovia telling me how to design my building, how to build my building. And what I promised them was that I wouldn't. But what I also promised them was that they needed to be a part of the whole project. And a good example of how, how we affected that was some of the things we told the architects and, and the building committees. And we just said, you know, we want people to be able to walk down the street and look inside these facilities, see the vibrancy that's going on inside these buildings. And likewise, we want people who are inside the buildings to be able to look out and see the vibrancy that's going on in another building. So every one of the architects, every one of the building committee, every one of these cultural groups embraced that idea and created a, 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 an effect in the campus where really you can't help but see what's going on in another building through one of the other buildings. And then the city, of course, was very concerned with how much money they were going to spend on these cultural facilities, even though they endorsed it and wanted to do it still a huge amount of money and, and they wanted to be as efficient as they could. So one of the things that I think we really brought to the table was the opportunity to create synergies, to, to leverage space. So for instance, if the Beckler Museum and the African American Cultural Facility wanted to both have a auditorium, what I said was, well gosh, I'm going to build a new auditorium anyhow, why don't we just share that? 
So that reduced the cost out of their, out of their buildings. Or, for instance, we built a parking deck which serves all these four cultural facilities. Or we built one air conditioning system that serves three of the cultural facilities. There were so many opportunities like that that if you had done this alone, you never would have been able to take advantage of that. And, and all the groups not only went along with that, but then bought into it and started coming up with their own ideas of how we could share and how we could um, just commonize space and commonize expenses that really sort of played on each other and just, just enabled this project to be the incredible project that it is. At the end of the day, we made a promise to the city, we made a promise to the county, we made a promise to the state, we made a promise to each of these cultural facilities, all their boards, and we made a promise to the Arts and Science Council. And in effect, we made a promise to this community that we would build these projects. We'd build them from the inside out so that their program is served best. That's what will keep these vital. That's what will keep these relevant for years and years. The architecture is stunning. The architecture is awesome. But it's the life inside the buildings that really is, gives meaning to the, to the buildings. And, and we promised that we would deliver these buildings on time and on budget. And that was a promise I made close to six years ago. And we're one day away from delivering every one of these projects on time and on budget and exactly what these folks envisioned. But the truth of the matter is what they are really getting is even beyond what they individually envisioned because of the incredible way this campus has come together and the incredible support all these groups and the people of this community have given this campus. One of the keys was that the story and the message that I told at the very beginning of this idea, this, this journey, was the same throughout the journey. And what you see today when you look at this campus is the exact image of what we promised we would produce. And that's pretty incredible in today's day and age that a project that's five, six years in the making delivers exactly what it said it would deliver on time and on budget. And, and sort of at the core of the whole campus is this, this incredible tower that you see behind you. And when we started with the tower, um, we felt as a corporation that it was important to be smart with our shareholder dollars, with smart with our capital investments. But we also felt like we needed to do the right things. And the right things encompassed an awful lot of various ideas. But, but one of the ideas we had was how do we make this as smart, as intelligent a building as we can, and as environmentally friendly as we can. And, and that's an easy thing to say, but it's really hard to do. And how do you do that? Um, I think for me, so many of the decisions that we had to make around this building um, came back to one statement that one of my team members said to me very early on in the project when we talked about an early environmental concept. And this building was just a dream. It was a vision. We hadn't really worked with an architect yet. And we talked about these sustainable ideas, and, and he said to me, um, if not us, who? If not now, when? And that little statement, I can't tell you the power that that statement had throughout this journey, because every time we'd come upon an opportunity, the easiest thing in the, do, in the world to do would be to say, that takes time, that takes money, let's keep moving. But, but I had this incredibly dedicated group of folks who came together who said, let's study that. Let's look at it. Let's evaluate it. Let's see what the cost is. Let's see what the benefit is. And, and let's make our decisions based on knowledge and facts rather than just speed and just expense. And in the long run, most of that additional capital has a huge return to not just our company, but to the environment and to this community, and that's what makes those decisions so meaningful, not just for today, but in the long term. Um, as, as we went through this journey together with all these different constituents, um, 
the most amazing thing happened to people as they came into this project. Everyone would come in sort of looking out for themselves, and the minute they got engaged in the project, they figured out what this was all about, that, that the sum truly was greater than the parts, and everyone's attitude was always, how do we make something happen? How do we make this happen rather than just protecting their own turf or rather than just looking out for themselves? Do you know how unique that is? You know how incredible that is to have not a dozen, not a couple dozen, not a couple hundred, but, but literally a thousand or two thousand people come together on a project and have this attitude of, how do we make this happen? How do we make it better? Uh, it's unique. Um, I often kid with folks about um, someday I'll be a grandpa and I'll be walking down the street and you sort of have this image of, you know, the builders pointing to some building and saying, look at that, kids. Your pap pap did that. That's never what I'll remember about this project. What I'll remember about this project is the legions of people who came in with this incredible attitude of how do we make this happen? How do we make it succeed? Inherent to the concept of sustainable design is the idea that these, these elements of um, environmental responsibility live on throughout the, the operation of the building. And the, the beautiful aspect of working with the Wachovia team, with Kurt and with Jeff and with Bob, and their leadership that they provided in the design and construction of this building is that it doesn't end there. This building will continue to be operated in the most environmentally responsible way possible. And we're still on a journey. And we're still learning how to do that. And we're still learning what that means. But we're so open to the learning. And every day we're incorporating what we're learning. And um, I'm, I'm really excited to have been a part of this project and a part of this team. And I can't wait to see you know, what it looks like and how much energy we're saving in, in 10 years and 20 years. The team took um, inspiration from a lot of different places, and one of those places is from Paul Hawken. He's, you know, of our generation, one of the most inspirational environmental and socially responsible advocates and writers and authors of, of our time. And um, there's a quote I'd like to share from him that's been a guiding light and a guiding principle for us through our journey. Leave the world better than you found it. Take no more than you need. Try not to harm life or the environment and make amends if you do.